nueva amiga and amigas, amigos. Thank you. Gracias, gracias Universidad Continental, gracias organizers, and it is quite late, and I won't say a whole lot of Spanish because I'm embarrassing myself. I am going to give you some talk, but I see that there's some alcohol over there. So I should not be an obstacle between you and the, and the I think it's the red wine, vino tinto. So, so we should be trying that very soon. However, let's try to give you a talk. It's okay. So actually the title of my talk, and if I talk slowly, it's going to be nine o'clock before you get up, but uh, I will try to talk, see if you can understand, renewable energy. So we started off with some bio talk, and we had some energy talks, molecular talks, computer talks, and a lot of environmental talks, and I'm gonna talk about second and third generation renewable energy that we have been working on for 25, 30 years, uh, and at different places. So I am the professor and the department head of chemical engineering at uh, Texas A&M University. And um, I just mentioned in here that I'm also a fellow of American Institute of Chemical Engineers. But other than that, I don't have any talents. Uh, I talk sometimes, but that's about it. So a little bit of things that I'm gonna talk to you about, not all of the things, because that's gonna take a lot of time. But if you see that, we use lignocellulosic biomass. What is lignocellulosic biomass? Trees, plants, this. Oh, this is real. <laughs> this is lignocellulosic biomass, and I can make biofuels from this. Maybe a drop or two drops but it's better to give it to her rather than me keeping it. Uh, so I didn't realize I thought it was plastic. Thank you so much, it's real flowers. Uh, so that's what we use. We use lignocellulosic biomass. We do molecular dynamic simulation, as Dr. Parla Belwena has mentioned before. We do simultaneous, this is what we have been working on, trying to bake ethanol from lignocellulosic biomass and make ethanol to replace oil. Oil is why a lot of Americans and other people have died in many parts of the world. And we don't want our sons and daughters to go and die again for those reasons. And therefore, if we can do something, which is the nature gives you, the world gives, the earth gives you, therefore we should use that resources that is renewable. Now, solar energy is renewable, and you had something on solar energy earlier today. So one of the things we did is to come up with, solve the problem of biofuels from plants. And the other thing is also, this is called the third generation, uh, this way. It's, I will be also talking a little bit about microalgae. We are, we're trying to come up with algae which grows very fast, produces a lot of oil, so that we can use this straight into refineries in some way, so that you don't have to buy oil, liquid oil. We also work, my group has worked in, in many, oops, okay, so something is happening here. Uh, we do also a lot of work with industry, and the industrial work is mostly on fault detection. When you have a plant and you have an accident, a lot of people die. How do you prevent it? So one of my trainings past-wise has been in fault detection, alarm management, and nowadays in United States, also all over the world, you have a lot of energy coming from natural gas, and those gas can be converted into liquid fuels. That's what we're doing in Texas a lot. But all of these come with complications. The plants becomes un they become unstable, and therefore you have to deal with fall detection, and we do a lot of these. I also have been working on, you know, you have pipelines. 
thousand, you can actually, in the US, the amount of pipeline we have, it can go around the world eight times. You have that much pipe, pipeline going all over the place, and the pipelines leak. You have corrosion, you have flanges which are not properly done and it's old, and they leak. But, you know, most of the time, the pipes are in an area that is desert or some other place. And therefore, how do you find where to go and look for the leaks before you have a big explosion? So we do that by this types of method. Uh, and I have a few PhD students who have finished. We also do some work with, you know, optimization of biorefineries using uh, nonlinear or linear programming types of methods. So these are some of the things that's going on in my group, my students. I'm in department head. I don't have time. They know my colleagues here. Uh, but I nevertheless try to do some work with my students. In 2005, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, 2005, you can see almost every part of the... Ah, this goes faster than I want it to go. It has... It, it actually, you can see South America is all lit up. All Asia and uh, Europe, all over the world, has lit up. So we are using so much energy. This tells you relative amount of energy that is being used. And this is eight years ago. So we are using more. So we are, you know, some people said one of US presidents, that we are drunk with oil or energy, but we are actually, we need a lot of energy. So question becomes, how do we do it? Another parameter that you have to figure out, because developing countries are telling, like developed countries, US, Europe, Japan, telling developing countries such as China and India that you should not burn a lot of coal, for example. But you see, look at this plot. This plot tells you per capita power consumption how much kilowatt per person that we spend in a given year, for example, per capita here. And in here is the GDP of a country. So if you think about it, this is North America. And this is Europe. And this is where the rest of the world is, Latin America here, South Asia here, Sub-Saharan. It forms a straight line. In general, you are, if you want to have, this is the area people say you have to have about this types of power consumption, roughly here, so that you are close to Europe. But then you have to make $20,000. But most of the countries make per capita, you see, five to $10,000. And your per capita power consumption goes down. In other words, you will have to increase your power consumption to make more per capita income go up, because that's the industrialization. But that's a two-way sword. If you increase the per capita consumption of energy, then you're going to increase what? Greenhouse gas. That's my next slide. OK, I'll show you in a minute here. So what happens is you have greenhouse gas in the world is going up. And there is a slide I'm not going to, I took out the slides. Somebody was showing this about how much CO2 has gone up, but one of the solutions of greenhouse gas in general is that you can use cellulosic ethanol or cell in this particular case, this is cellulosic ethanol, you can see the greenhouse gas emission from cellulosic gas is much less, but if you look at a gasoline or any ethanol from corn, all of these are much less, I mean, they're much higher. So you have to think about where do I want to spend my money? The, another, so what I'm going to point out to you that there are different ways you can make cellulosic ethanol. This is many, many roots are given to you here. These are all the raw materials right here on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side is the product. So I can make jet fuel if I want to. I can make ethanol, which is what I'm showing here. I can make butanol. So this green line is where I work. I work with corn stover sugar cane or starch, switchgrass, these types of material, and using sacrification and fermentation, I make this, these two products. Some other people make, bio, I'm also making biodiesel, or at least I'm trying to make one. Uh, I produce some oil from lipid. 
I do this. But these are the things that other people in the country, you can do Fischer-Tropp's reaction, and you can make jet fuel and paralysis all other ways. But you can make anything you like for your car because liquid fuel is what you need. You still need liquid fuel and it will, need, you'll be, it will be there for 50 years. Electric cars can be possible, but electric planes are not that easy. And for big uh, shipping, organ shipping that pipelines and others, uh, you have to have liquid oil. So with that, you, you see that uh, I'll show you what I mean by first generation uh, biofuel is the one that we may be drinking. That was developed thousands of years ago making alcohol. And that's the first generation from yeast fermentation that you all know. Second generation basically is from, you have wood. I mean, I don't want to cut trees, but you, you can make from trees. And you add, do some pre-processing like you do when you make paper, pulp and paper. You make chips, and then you add acid hydrolysis, you get xylose. And then whatever the byproduct is, you add some enzymes and you make glucose, so you have xylose and glucose, you do recombinant fermentation, and you make ethanol, you distill and molecular sieve, you get ethanol and lignin, which can be burned. Lignin can be burned so that it produces, you don't need energy from outside as much as possible. Now, what I'm talking about is a third, third generation biofuels, uh, which is what I call, Tamu is Texas A&M University, that's what we do. And this is telling you the overall picture. This is the, I could call that the last slide. Solar energy, it goes to plant. You pre-treat with acid or some other. You get pentose sugar. We do, we have developed a one-step process, microbial process, which produces directly ethanol. I, you notice that I have no, there is no enzymes in here. Enzymes is produced in the cell. Enzyme is one third of the cost of ethanol production. That's why it's still not, people are not making that much. They're making from sugar. So ethanol production, ethanol is in here and we, this is something few of us have developed. I can make ethanol or butanol. And the cellulose that I have that can go back and get in the boiler, is, sorry, cellulose this way. This comes in here, the lignin goes to the boiler and you get power. You can see that CO2 that comes in from the fermentation goes into microalgae, and you get algae oil this way, and it's extracted. And what we have done also is to combine microalgae and this fermentation here and produce bioelectricity. And that's a new concept, and I might show you. So we have three things. You get ethanol, you get algae oil, we also make electricity from fuel cells. So that you can combine them and make electricity. So having said that, let me show you some, some results that we have done. So when you get corn stover, this is not corn, you have corn, the trees of the corn if you like. Uh, those things, when you do hydrolysis with uh, acid, it becomes really dark black stuff because of lignin. This darkness is because of lignin. And this we have then converted by a microbial process. I'll show you the later on. So just look at this picture of this one now, how it is. It looks very dirty, but we can use this to ferment and make ethanol. And I'll show you in a minute. This is some picture that uh, Dr. Himmel, he does molecular simulation. So basically cellulose is difficult to degrade because it has many, you know, biomass has a lot of components. And a lot of enzymes are needed. These are at least three types of enzymes that are needed to hydrolyze them and make uh, from cellulose to sugar. So here is, I don't think this is going to work. Okay, it doesn't work. So if you see these cellulose sheets, this is, this is where you have crystalline cellulose, amorphous cellulose, and enzymes, there is supposed to be, it's not in the computer, it's in my computer, so it's not gonna work. There's an enzyme that's gonna come up and is gonna cut it. So this long, long chain that you have breaks down into you know, one single monomers and a dimer and multiple things, and you can actually make this into sugar. Once you can 
convert it into sugar, then you can ferment them. Everything can get, everything is fermented. So this is what happens. If you look at the cellulose, take a AFM picture. This is how it looks like. You can see that these are the valleys and so on. And if you treat with enzyme, you see that the valleys, the cellulose, these valleys have, has been degraded by the enzymes. It's, it's after 12 hours. If you keep it about 90, about 70 to 80 hours, you'll see it's all, all gone. So what we did, as I was trying to tell you, we don't use enzymes. We make enzyme in the same microbial cell that also makes ethanol. Now, we are not using yeast. We are using E. coli, but you can use yeast if you like. So the idea is we have renewable biomass, which is cellulose, which is coming from this plant. This is the cellulose. And I express genetically modified E. coli. I express different types of enzyme on the cell surface. So when the cellulose comes here on top, it takes cellulose, and because of the way it gets in, it produces glucose. And the glucose then, the cell, same cell, not a different cell, the same cell then produce ethanol. So here I put cellulose, and I get ethanol, and it's done by same microorganism. And that's the reason why we do not use these, you see these enzymes, normally you'll be buying these enzymes, and we don't buy. And that's one third of the cost of making ethanol from cellulose. So cellulosic ethanol, so we have shown that. We fermented in this types of fermenters. And we got, for example, this is for, you can see that this is the beginning sugar concentration, 100% converted. And, we got, and there are other sugars, uh, five carbon other sugars. And we get about 95% theoretical yield. So this was good, and student got a PhD thesis, and she left for another university. But we also wanted to find out. A lot of people say, if I use ethanol, you lose about 25% of the efficiency of the car. Why? Because if you look at ethanol, the, the overall the octane rating is high, but you can look at the energy density compared to gasoline you can see that it's 30 to 2. So you lose about close to 66%, 33%. And that's not good because people don't like that. Brazil makes it all the time. In the US, all the cars have, all the gas stations have 10% ethanol. So if you buy this from pure gasoline and you buy something which is a blend, you lose you know, about 10% or 15% of your efficiency. So for that reason, butanol is a better fuel because it has the energy density similar to gasoline, and it can be transported in a pipeline. You cannot transport ethanol in the pipeline, which is what infrastructure is in many places. So, but butanol can be transported, and it's four carbon sugar, right? So it's better for you. So what we did is we, I told my student, the same student, I said we would like to genetically make butanol in E. coli, see if we can do that. Why? Because E. coli grows faster. And it's, it's not complicated microorganism. We know more about it. So here it is. Normally, if you go to a cheese factory, you will find that you have, what do you have? You have, if, you know, if, if you go to a cheese factory and you find that it, it smells some air, waste area, it smells. And what you have in there, Clostridium acetobutericum. Clostridium acetobutericum smells. And that's what this is. But it produces butyric acid, which is the smelly part, but it also produces butanol. So you see that this is the pathway. And I told my student, clone me this pathway. From here, this way, blue. It, from here, all the way to blue. This pathway here is common to E. coli and a clostridium. So from here to here, E. coli doesn't have it, and we have synthetically change this pathway in E. coli. So what we did is we took this pathway, we added the clostridium pathway, but E. coli also produces many other side products. It produces some ethanol, and I don't want to produce ethanol in this case. I want to make butanol, four carbon sugar. So we blocked, genetically we blocked this pathway, that pathway, that pathway, that pathway, this pathway, that pathway. 
so that what we wanted to make is glucose straight into butanol. You can say you have a monster microorganism, not the real one. I mean, you started with something, now you have something else. But it's still E. coli, and it grows. And I just have a final result here. You can see that we started off with glucose. We got butanol, though we got rid of pathways, lactate. We had lactate produced because microorganisms are very smart. When it, you block off some pathway, it goes back and try to create some other pathway. And it did make some other very ancient pathway active and it makes some lactic acid. So you can make glucose from glucose butanol and lactic acid in E. coli in about 45 minutes. Now lactic acid can be used. What can it be used? It can be used for as biodegradable polymers. You can po make it polylactate and make biodegradable polymers so you wouldn't have pollution of all the plastics in your garbage disposal places. One of the things I want to caution you and that is all of these things are good, but see, to increase the amount of energy U.S. uses, billions of gallons of ethanol is needed. Right now, we have 230 ethanol plants in the U.S., and it is made from corn, maize. So U.S. grows corn, sweet corn, not the same type, not the nice ones that you have here, sweet corn and it produces ethanol and that's what goes to all the gasoline in the country we do not make it from cellulose they're trying but you see the problem is when you do that you have large see this is the area of mississippi river and this is where all the plants are situated and also this area also tells you that they're using fertilizers all over the United States. This is all the fertilizer map. To grow more, you use more fertilizer. You use more insecticides. All these green areas that they're also using insecticides and pesticides because that's how you can increase the productivity. What happens is all of these ends up, because all the ethanol plants are here, all this, and then they end up in this area. This is the Mississippi River. Everything in the U.S. goes through Mississippi River, almost everything. As a result, you, it happens, you see this. This is Gulf of Mexico. This is outside and this is the area where the river is coming into dumping, if you like. This is the river. Now, you can say, well, it could be like that. I mean, so what? The color doesn't say much. But what it does say, if you do measure the dissolved oxygen concentration in the area of, see, this is the area, this is the delta, that's Mississippi River. If you look at all of this area, you can see all the red lines means you have low dissolved oxygen, which means you're losing valuable fish, shrimp, and all other things are slowly going away. So you have to be careful that it is necessary to have good industry, good agriculture, high productivity, but you have to be careful what else you do. So I'm just going to show you a quick slide on how we grow algae. One of the things we have done is we have looked at algae that produces more. I don't know how many of you have worked with algae. Algae does not only produce one algae to two algae, two algae to four algae. It actually, sometimes you find a clump of 12 one algae produces 12, sometimes it produces four. So I was actually trying to figure out by doing microfluidic experiment, uh, which is, we, we made a microfluidics is like a, uh, like a nickel, small, and inside you have all these, uh, we, we made some droplets. These droplets inside, as you can, I'll show you in a minute, and we can make droplets, so inside is the algae coming in, oil here, and if, if the movie that I have, it works, then I'll show you a picture. So we trap all the algae in this droplet. So this droplet becomes, it's a 10 nanoliter size droplet. It becomes a reactor. And I can trap one algae and see how it grows. And therefore I can look at all different types of algae and see how, which ones produces the most. So for example, let's see if this works. Uh, it doesn't. 
there's supposed to be a, a uh, okay, it's not in my computer. This is supposed to come here and produce a droplet you've seen here, a droplet, 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 and that's it's like this one comes in and produces these droplets. And then it moves, you can see that it's, it's moved. So the movie isn't working, but, uh, but I, I can guarantee you that the, you, you'll see that. So in the droplet, if you look at, we, this is one droplet, then there's many. So we try to figure out if you can have the droplets, which ones produce and what is the size of it. So we're trying to figure some of those out. Just to give you an example, if we started off with one, one, one species, one droplet gave me five, and one, you see, one gave me 80. So this is interesting. One gave me 80, one gave me five. One, one only went to five. So which one would I use if I'm going to make a microorgan, a algae process? I will give, I will sell this to the industry, and they can then uh, make more oil out of it. That's the whole idea. So this paper got published in a journal, and there's some other in here trying to tell you what the growth curve looks like, what the cell size, cell size from five to about seven, and we can grow them. You can see inside these, all the algaes are growing inside the droplet. So the whole idea for algae was like this, that if the algae grows and we make four, four makes 16 and so on, then I find the best producing algae and I make an automated system. I start off with the, micro, with the microfluidic devices here, and I color them. I check which one it is. It goes through this, takes like, say, five days, and it comes in here, separates out. I take it out and give it to the industry. From here to here, I want to automate that. This, this, then this becomes a selection process, selection of the highest oil-producing algae. That's what we do. And this is uh, now in the lab. And actually, in case you want to see a nice picture, this is a picture of microscopic picture which shows you how much lipid we have. The, all the yellow lines that you see, these are the lipids. That's the oil. So you, we're trying to figure out, rather than measuring by soxalate extraction, can we do imaging which can provide us with uh, uh, what, what is the total amount of algae oil we have. The other one, because uh, Dr. Paula Balwena talked about fuel cells, we use microbial fuel cells to produce, so here is, I'll give you an example here. So in, in general, you have a fuel cell where you have oxygen coming here, and you know, proton goes this way, but what we do is we grow cells in one side, and now algae on this side, here we make ethanol, here we make algae oil, we put the load, and electricity flows, we cut, and here's the load. And if we do this, we can make electricity, and this is also a project that's going on in my lab. So this is electricity, so this is how it sort of looks like. We have also studied big ones, but that's basically how it looks like. You can see the algae growing over here, the yeast is growing, and in here we have the membrane compartment and we are running this, trying to figure out how to make all three, algae, electricity, and ethanol, okay? Well, I think that should be it. I'm trying to tell you that we can make renewable energy possible these days. Some money is needed. That's probably always the question. Uh, we also have introduced the concept, last few slides, on electrofuels. Uh, Scale-up technology is still a challenge. But more importantly, we still need to know the fundamentals. Uh, uh, what I'm trying to tell you is the fundamental understanding. And many of these things require interdisciplinary work. I had molecular biologists. I had control system engineers. I had also people who do computational work, MD simulations. Uh, so there are different type, chemical engineers. So there's all kinds of people that you need. And you have to integrate them in order to get these types of work done. Well, muchas gracias. These are some of my uh, previous group members. Thank you.